Welcome everybody. Um, my talk this evening is to concentrate on the recent conservation of both painting and frame of this portrait gifted to the Society in 2017. In October 2018, I gave a long 50 minute lecture, lunchtime lecture here, on the portrait such as we knew about it at that point. And that's still on our website if you want more information about the iconography, the historical de detail, um, history of costume issues uh, about this um, picture. But I will resume in the first five to ten minutes some of the major things that um, I raised at that time. Um, here's the painting in a way before and after conservation. Now I'm showing you on the right there, and I will be showing you tonight, my fairest pictures of it. Um, this is not, as it happens, the best time of day to see the picture on the stairs in this dark um, and artificial light. It do come during the day when the daylight comes through that top window and it will really um, sing to you more, much more emphatically. But you can immediately see here um, one aspect of restoration that had to be attended to, this tear up here, which has now um, been repaired. This is the first old master picture. Um, to enter the Society's collection for more than a quarter of a century since Martin Folks here, just to the right of the screen. Um, and therefore, it's um, a, a moment of some significance for our collecting history. Uh, Charles Marsh was born in 1735. He was the son of a London bookseller. He went to Westminster School and uh, became clerk in the War Office after graduating from Trinity, Cambridge. Uh, he retired on a pension of £1,000 a year, large sum in um, uh, at the time he uh, gave up his job, but um, somehow he had a huge fortune. It was not absolutely clear where all this money came from. Um, there's no will or inventory for him, but there is a declaration signed by his sister after his death in the National Archives, and there she attests to his estate worth £48,000. That excludes his properties. Um, Marsh is buried in Westminster Abbey uh, with his nephew, the Reverend Thomas Viles, a family name, the Viles family, which will um, recur uh, in this talk uh, when I come to consider the frame. And we know from Thomas Viles' will that um, having... Um, um, provided for his wife, Louisa, and his three young sons, um, who were only to get £250 a year to see them through their education, he asked very specifically to be buried with his uncle um, in the Abbey's East Cloister. Also to do with this connection, um, attached to the stretcher at the bottom of the um, work, now detached in the conservation and part of the archive on this painting here, at the Society, um, is an inscription testifying that this is Charles Marsh, um, that the painter is L.F. Abbott, and crucially at the end, an admirable likeness much prized by his nephew, the Reverend Thomas Viles. Um, Charles Marsh bought the huge Radnor House at Twickenham in 1799, a house which survived into the 20th century but was gutted um, during the Second World War by uh, bombing. Um, but we do have some photographs from Country Life taken in the 1930s um, which show its mid-18th century decoration and those articles show that it seems very unlikely that Marsh at the end of the 18th century did substantial work in the house but here he probably kept his collection including probably the portrait which now hangs on the staircase and that his library, at his death, we do know, was valued at £2,500. And that documentary record um, from the Declaration fills in the background to the local historians of the 19th century, historians of Richmond and Twickenham, who uh, say all the time that he was a very bookish man and he had a great book collection. But also um, uh, that... Um, Charles Marsh also lived in an apartment here on Piccadilly. So it seems extra special that in a way, and he may well have died somewhere along this street, um, we don't know. Um, so it seems very special that he's in a sense coming home with the acquisition of this portrait. 
and both Westminster, both Piccadilly, and his um, house at Radnor are cited as his residence in the 1812 um, to 13 Declaration. If you go to Radnor House today, you'll find on site just two 18th century Gothic and Chinese summer houses. The house, as I said, was completely bombed and took an Umbara council who owned it at that time, just flattened what remained. And of course, looking at this and looking back to the, that print of the house in the uh, 18th century, um, its Gothic appearance inevitably raises um, the spectre of Horace Walpole and Strawberry Hill, because Strawberry Hill is just a few hundred yards away. Now, um, Marsh bought Radnor in 1799 after Walpole's death, and there's not a lot of evidence that they knew each other at all well. There's just one reference to Marsh, and a rather disparaging one, in, War uh, in Walpole's um, um, extensive correspondence, um, like so many people, disparaging references by the great man. But there is one connection in the bottom <coughs> right there that's quite interesting, art historically, in the 1750s when the Swiss artist J.H. Muntz was working for both um, Horace Walpole and John Shute of, of the Vine in imagining um, the, um, their estates and buildings that could be put along, uh, alongside them, he draws quite specifically the river frontage of Radnor House with those temples um, obviously attached in those days to <coughs> other buildings um, shown in that image. Now, why is he here? Well, um, why um, Charles Marsh is here, why it's so appropriate he should come here. He was made a fellow of the Society in 1784, and he gave a paper to the Society on the Barberini Portland Vase, now, of course, in the British Museum, just a couple of months after it was shown to the Society, and very interestingly, at the time that it was in transit between Sir William Hamilton and the Duchess of Portland. So, at a very interesting moment, and he, um, Charles Marsh published that piece with a, uh, in Latin but with a preface in English in Archaeologia in 1787. In this, he contests, as is shown in the portrait, um, with the uh, French writer Bernard de Montfaucon in his L'Antiquité Expliquée, that's um, an image taken from our copy of the book, um, because he's leaning, as you can see down in the book, and I've just turned it upside down to show it's this particular volume that he's contesting in terms of the iconography of the, of the work. Interestingly, of course, the vase is shown in the portrait um, in reverse. That's to say it follows the print tradition of showing this picture, um, showing this, this um, work, um, the, the Portland vase, through things going back as far as um, Bartoli's image, uh, originally published in uh, 1697. We have here the 1704 edition in the library. But that reversal, and it's, it's very interesting uh, that you must imagine a studio situation in the painter Ella Abbott's studio. Um, the artists or assistants use the print version when the owner had actually seen the real thing just recently. But of course, in that transit time, it was passing into the Dutch of Portland's collection. If indeed the portrait was painted at that particular moment, um, it may have been subsequently inaccessible. The painter, um, L.F. Abbott, um, famous as the, port uh, the portraitist of the standard image of Nelson and other great Navy figures, and it may therefore be that um, uh, uh, Marsh's uh, role, as it were, in the War Office uh, brings him into contact with this particular portrait painter. <laughs> There's some ten or so portraits by um, Abbott in the National Portrait Gallery collect collections, including the portrait there on the right of the sculptor Joseph Nolkins. And that has a particular association also with this um, portrait um, and th this painter because the year after Abbott died, uh, in Farringdon's diary, he says he, that he goes to the workshop of Nolkins um, and um, that um, Abbott's son is working there as an apprentice in his teenage years. Uh, he said he's been rescued by the, um, by the sculptor because um, the young Nolkins' mother, um, a very um, 
forthright and um, believing Roman Catholic wanted him to go to the priesthood um, and Farringdon adds, but she is a bigot. Um, just reminding us that even in that run-up to the emancipation of the 1820s, things were very divided. Um, so Nolkins also has this connection with um, L.F. Abbott in terms of his son working in his studio. Now to turn in the second half of my time to the conservation of the painting. We were advised when the painting came into the collection in 2017 that it was at that point um, too um, fragile to hang. It had been hanging in um, houses mainly along the river at Twickenham. It did have a time when it was elsewhere, but mainly in one family after the other along the river at Twickenham for many years. But that's in private houses. People take their own risks. We could not hang it here in the society without conservation. The frame in particular was too fragile, and of course the surface of the picture was damaged. It was on its original pine strainer rather than a stretcher and was unlined. Um, the initials WW on the bottom of that strainer may uh, indicate to us the initials of the strainer maker. Um, what's very interesting is uh, that the uh, picture itself was probably, uh, or the canvas on which it sits was probably bought um, uh, ready-made, as many late 18th century artists would have done. It's painted on a very conventional 18th century white ground. Um, it had already had um, a, a, a patch that had been uh, restored here, uh, which was very visible when it first came to us. And because of that, it may be because of that, that it was covered with a wax finish um, on the back. And then, of course, we had the small, very visible tear um, above that. Um, the surface of the picture has a very um, granular surface. Um, the conservator says it's quite, um, happens quite a lot in these late 18th century pictures. It may show the residue of some soap in the ground of the picture, but it is, it's got a nice kind of granular, as it were, um, surface to it, which I think gives a sense of the, the, the making of the picture. Um, we're also advised that the picture may have been cleaned at some point in the 1950s and 60s, at the time when the initial big tear was repaired. Anyway, now it's um, cleaned, uh, repaired, it's on a new stretcher and is lined. And what's wonderful about this is I talk to various picture conservators that I know. Um, one of the things that they will sometimes say is that when you, when you um, clean a picture, you somehow lose something of the, um, the surface appearance. Um, but I can assure you when you go up the stairs and I say, I'm, essentially I'm putting my fairest and blondest images here, up to show the details of the picture, that nothing has been lost. It still looks a wonderful old picture. Um, it's just now secure and uh, well cared for. What is the date of this picture? When does he have his portrait painted? Of course, one wants to think, first of all, that surely it's the 1780s when he writes the article. Um, as time has gone by, I rather wondered if we're not moving this portrait in our minds into the 1790s, the last decade of L.F. Abbott's life. He dies in 1802. Um, and um, that, um, that's because when I look at this uh, alongside other Abbott's I've seen, and particularly images like this, the great portrait, the, the prime version of this portrait of um, Viscount, Admiral Viscount Bridport in the Yale Centre for British Art, the primary version, because that's the kind of picture that collection has tended to buy. Um, uh, it does bear comparison, and particularly by showing those faces, this blondness, this fairness, that the Dean, of course, 18th century men had abandoned, or, or were abandoned, the process of abandoning, except for formal occasions, their wigs by this time. So this, the natural appearance of the hair is very striking uh, and vibrant um, in this work. And that's why also, um, I wonder if it's not a picture from the 1790s. Just to say a little bit then about the um, history and treatment of the frame. 
Uh, our conservator um, uh, has advised there were three phases to the gilding of this frame. And this is where the name of Viles comes back <coughs> in. As some of you may know, the Viles workshop was one of the most famous 18th century frame makers. They worked for Reynolds. Some of his pictures at the Royal Academy next door were made by that workshop. Um, but uh, it's therefore tempting that at the time in the 1780s and 90s, um, the work, the whole workshop had been left to Sarah Viles, the niece of Thomas Viles, um, nephew of, um, of Charles Marsh. And it's therefore tempting to think that she led the, the campaign in the workshop to get um, her uncle's uh, picture framed. But it does seem, we are advised, that this, this isn't a, 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 a frame that's been made very specifically for this picture. The picture really is really is elbowing out and always has elbowed out its frame. The frame has been modified in order to um, bring this picture into line. So an interesting family collection, possibly, but, um, in, and, and I would also argue for that in terms of the decoration of the frame, it is quite close to some of those frames. Made, made for famous uh, paintings by Reynolds. That the first campaign was a mauve coloured bowl, um, and traces of this did appear in the conservation. And um, what you can see here is this very delicate colour with very, very fine gilding. As time went by, gilding got, um, uh, what's the word to use? Cruder, more um, speedily done. Um, in, in restor restorative programs. So this very delicate um, gilding. And we were talking just the other day about thinking of these pictures being seen in the late 18th century by candlelight, by the late 19th century, when other forms of light and gas and later are coming in. Um, uh, you, you, you want things to have more bling and more splendor. So this very delicate um, candlelit effect on the original gilding. And then overlaying this, um, uh, not very long after, possibly within a generation or less in the early 19th century, the paint, there's an oil uh, gilded scheme um, on a yellow base uh, laid onto a gesso surface. And you can see that in the background behind me, um, uh, the ornament here, and just some highlights of that scheme coming through the later final scheme. And it was that final scheme, the 19th, uh, the 19th century scheme, probably sometime from the 1860s onwards, um, that really was in, in very uh, poor condition. Um, much uh, fragmentation and cracking. Um, this is uh, where water gilding was used on the top and back edge of the profile and oil gilding elsewhere. So the original delicacy of that first phase of gilding when the portrait of Marsh was made um, uh, is now long compromised, and um, we raised a large sum of money in order to have this work done. It would have taken much, much longer to try and get back to that original scheme. So the um, compromise is that the 19th century scheme of gilding is now expertly restored and will um, see this picture um, through for generations to come picture looking now at the state of the back from its original deteriorated condition where it's been lined and placed on the stretcher. And finally, just to look again at the wonderful details of this picture, I, I, I feel this picture is not only appropriate here because of the subject, but it is, it is a very fine late 18th century portrait. In fact, Lucy Pelt from the National Portrait Gallery, when she first saw it, said, oh, it's too good to be by a Abbott. But I think she was thinking of some of those in the portrait gallery and not some of his prime works like the one um, at Yale. Um, I think we have a very, very fine picture here. And um, one which we have various avenues of research we can now pursue through the archaeology and the history of the Portland Bars, um, through the um, history of a man like Marsh and his role in government in the late 18th century. And also, very much, I think, interesting for our times, L.F. Abbott died uh, committed to a mental asylum. And I think our current interest in that history of health and creativity in the arts um, in, uh, with, for people who um, are battling serious mental and physical health issues means that we can explore, too, 
uh, things about that artist's um, uh, last decade. And finally, my thanks here listed down to the last uh, one, which I really must mention, um, our donors who contributed to the project for conservation, without whom we could never have accepted or hung this picture. And finally, to my friend Sheila Lockhart, whom I persuaded to give this picture to the society because it was right, and it's very much in memory of her um, late brother, Simon Orford, who would have been a fellow of this society um, and amongst us had he lived. Thank you very much. fellows, guests, and our staff of the Society, um, who are the unsung heroes of Burlington House. Um, the Society has, since its early years, taken a strong interest in the Palace of Westminster. Fellows were famously involved in the controversies over James Wyatt's remodelling of St Stephen's Chapel around 1800, and have subsequently often been the first to hear of new findings from the likes of Sidney Smirk, William Letherby, and so forth. And recently, the Antiquaries Journal has carried reports on the palace by Mark Collins and others, and by Henrik Schoenfeld. So the discoveries reported to you today originated with the St Stephen's Chapel project at the University of York emerging directly from a study supported by York and the Houses of Parliament and generously part-funded by the Lee for Hume Trust. And this talk about them, created specially for the festive season, has elements of a detective story. It features a light bulb, a light bulb moment, subversive Victorian graffiti, and a lost head of Charles I. It also represents much teamwork, and I pay particular tribute to those mentioned here, two of whom, Mark Collins and Paul Honeyball, are present this evening. Dr John Crook is sadly not able to be here, but his archaeological findings and his drawings and photos form a critical part of this tale. So here's the location of the doorway and the passageway in question at the southeast corner of Westminster Hall. So that's the Palace of Westminster guidebook there, and that's it on a drawing by John Crook. So that's where you come in, and that's the gift shop there, and this is the south end. So the former entrance, which is the lost Tudor doorway in question, it's marked in the hall by a bronze plaque of 1895. It's just there. Um, this informs posterity that an archway here served as the main entrance to the House of Commons from 1547 to 1680. Can those of you at the back view this um, writing? does go on at length, um, but it's actually largely unnoticed by the public. And as far as I can tell, academics and a few insiders have long been aware of the doorway and passageway through the wall of the hall, but they believed that the space within the wall was wholly sealed up and inaccessible. Some have also questioned the precise dates given on the plaque. As the passageway appears in 18th century plans, it was clearly not locked off in 1680. Similarly, 1547 was thought to be a bit too early for its creation, but the consensus was that a date of around 1600 seemed the most probable moment for when it was um, cut through the wall, and thus it features on an important academic reconstruction of the layout of this part of the old palace in about 1640. So the passageway joined Westminster Hall with the West <coughs> Range of St Stephen's Tudor Cloisters, built circa 1550 to 1515 to 27, and hugely admired by generations of antiquaries, if not, unfortunately, by their actual occupants. 
um, some of whom in the mid-20th century described them as the Gothic slum. After several centuries of misuse, these were restored by Charles Barry after the 1834 fire. And most recently, they've been used as the MP's cloakroom from 1852 to 1967. And there they are set up as a cloakroom. And then as offices from 1967 to 2017. They're currently empty and awaiting restoration. And now the detective story begins because it was with great surprise and pleasure that on a research trip to the Historic England Archives in Swindon, I discovered this photo of the ceiling of the interior of the passageway, dated 13 June 1949. I wondered how we would ever be able to get into this space, and I asked Dr Collins if I could take a pneumatic drill <laughs> into the cloisters, and I was not surprisingly turned down. So, also found in Swindon was a measured plan of the space, so that's that top one, made for Sir Giles Gilbert Scott. It became clear that his workmen had rediscovered the passageway when restoring the wall damaged cloisters. Um, the, the restoration was between 1948 and 1952. Now, the damage here had resulted from a high explosive bomb in 1940, which had sadly destroyed the eastern and southern ranges. Now, the West Cloister also suffered. Our passageway lies behind here. That's the second bay um, along. Um, but like the rest of this range, it remained intact. See, it's a very, very badly in a very, very bad condition. It's heavily restored after the war. Um, we know that Scott had walled the space up again by 1952. Then we noticed in a TNA file that he considered leaving a small gap in the cloister side's wall, which would be covered by a hinged panel, giving access within his new cloakroom furniture. Was the panel there? Yes, it was. There it is. In December 2018, a tiny and inconspicuous <coughs> keyhole was found in Scott's cloakroom fittings in the correct bay. The parliamentary locksmith opened it and pulled back the hinged access panel, enabling Mark Collins to clamber in into the hidden passageway and here's some photos of the inside. Now, two former parliamentary staff with very long experience and deep knowledge of the building knew nothing of the appearance of the space or of the access panel. And we believe that we were the first people to go in there for several decades, and quite possibly since about 1952. Clearly, all knowledge of the panel and passageway had been lost in the intervening years. I think that the Labour MPs who'd had their desks just next door to this um, during the 1970s and 1980s would have been extremely surprised had they known about it. Well, what did we find in that? Well, it has to be said that at first sight, this is a rather unassuming spot but it is full of interest. So some key features, it's complex masonry, many exposed brickwork and plaster from several different eras. These have been recorded and investigated by John Crook. The doorway, the door case and soffits of the great doorway, there. Um, four iron pintles for the two doors, one shown here. On the floor are Purbeck flagstones, which are worn at the centre, which is rather thrilling. There's also some graffiti by masons from the 19th and 20th centuries, written in pencil on mid-19th century plaster. So the one pictured here reads, 1950, Alex Leeper, Mason, Stonehaven. Now, he was clearly one of Giles Gilbert Scott's workers, 
Um, he is to be found in the electoral registers for 1950 and 1951, living at 33 Millbank. His family came from Perth and Kinross, so it's obviously the same chap. And finally, and very remarkably, a still functioning Osram light bulb <laughs> of what I believe to be a, a 1950s, early 1950s style with electrical wiring and a switch of the same period, which immediately sprang into life. <laughs> Although the light bulb has now sadly been retired for health and safety reasons. <laughs> Above were some wooden joists laid flat, once covered in lath and plaster, supporting the ceiling masonry. Then, in October 2019, so this is not long ago, in fact it was after I'd put forward this talk to the Society, the timbers of the joists were isotope dated by Dr Dan Miles of the Ox Oxford Dendrochronology Laboratory to spring 1659. Now, this was an immense surprise to us. <laughs> it caused us to question all our previous assumptions about the dating of the doorway and the passageway, which had been based broadly around the, data, the dates on the plaque. There were also major implications here for the layout of the area around St Stephen's Chapel in the 16th and the first half of the 17th centuries. So, we revisited all relevant building accounts, plans and drawings. So a range of relevant evidence supports the proposition that right up to about 1660, the route from the hall to the south end of the palace and then to the House of Commons was not via our doorway. Instead, it seems to have remained via the medieval door on the south wall of Westminster Hall. So that's there. Um, mentioned by John Stowe and recorded by Ellen L. N. Cottingham and Robert and Sidney Smirk. That door appears clearly on the left-hand side of the drawing of the layout for Elizabeth I's coronation in 1550, next to the dais of the King's High Table. A drawing of the law courts from about the 1620s here. Um, once attributed to Holler, is consistent with this arrangement continuing during the first half of the 17th century. And note also that this important plan of the cloisters from 1593, from the Cecil papers at Hatfield House, shows no sign of the other side of the passageway, which should have been there. All this explains also why we were really struggling to find any mention of the creation of the doorway in, the, in the, the accounts from before 1660, although admittedly these are very patchy. Um, the works accounts actually show that the southern door and route were blocked off in 1660 to 61 when the dais at the south end of the hall was remodelled and, re and extended for Charles II's coronation, as written up by Dr. Mark Collins and others in their report published in the Antiquaries Journal. And the works accounts also demonstrate that our passageway was not through the wall of the hall in 1660-61 to 61 to replace it. This is a transcript by Simon Neal for the St Stephen's Chapel project. It is absolutely invaluable and very interesting. Now, this is the absolute clincher because John Crook is confident that the dimensions given in the accounts match exactly those of our doorway and passageway. Also, the stone they record for the sill, Kentish step or rag, looks right, as shown in the photograph of the door, sill on the hall side exposed during repairs in 2014. So, the new doorway and passageway clearly marked a grand processional route for the king, used for coronations, as shown in Francis Sandford's plan for his history of the coronation of James II, published in 1687. This was also the main way to the House of Commons and for a while to the south end of the palace. As noted in the accounts, a head of Charles I was above the doorway. 
but first in a cartouche. In 1704, it was replaced by a bust of the king, as shown here. The design of this was later attributed to Bernini, but it was almost certainly after Hubert de Sœur. This remained in situ until about 1790. It could perhaps be the bronze version now in the royal collection. It'd be nice to think so, but perhaps someone here will know something about heads of Charles, lost heads of Charles I. I would very much like some information. Um, now here is a real triumph. This is actually the only picture we found of the doorway. Um, in a print in Brit Britannica Illustrata of 1727, where it's described down here as the entrance of the House of Commons. The inset is a rectified version made by John Crook. So there it is. Um, by this time, another more central door at the south end of Westminster Hall had replaced it as the main route through to the House of Lords and Old Palace Yard. It was still puzzling about when that was actually knocked through. There are a lot of door-related puzzles in the Palace of Westminster, and, in particularly, and particularly in Westminster Hall, um, and they will keep us going for a very long time. <laughs> um, throughout the 18th century, the doorway and passageway appear in numerous plans of Westminster Hall and its surrounding buildings. This example from the Office of Works plans in TNA, also showing William Kent's Gothic Revival Law Courts, dates from between 1768 and 1794. Then, in 1794, the cloisters and the grand house surrounding them passed to the Speaker of the House of Commons. In 1802-7, James Wyatt remodelled it at vast expense for Speaker Charles Abbott, removing the partitions from the West Cloister and by 1807, locking off the great doorway on the hall side. However, the cloister side of the passageway remained open. Fast forward to the 1834 fire, and then to the building of the new palace, whilst the two Houses of Parliament remained on site in constantly shifting temporary buildings. Now, is there a lesson there, I wonder? <laughs> I think there is from this MP's pocket plan of 1847, because it gives us some idea of the complex circulation arrangements which were needed, particularly to bypass St Stephen's entrance and hall, at that stage under construction. And there's the cloisters, and there is the passageway. There are also committee rooms all the way along there. It must have been incredibly difficult for members to find their way around. Um, because in 1846, Barry had had to reopen the hall side of our passageway to provide an access route via the cloisters to the north end of the site. But finally, in 1851, the passageway was walled in on both sides when Barry was restoring and remodelling the cloisters. Graffiti inside the passageway marks this event in a most vivid way. <laughs> I love this. I absolutely love this bit. This room was enclosed by Tom Porter, who was very fond of old ale. The parties who witnessed the articles of the wall was R. Congdon Mason, J. Williams, H. Terry, T. Parker, P. Duval. These masons were employed refacing these groins of the cloister. August the 11th, 1851. Real Democrats. <laughs> so all of these festive worthies, Charles Barry's workmen, turn up in the 1851 census. Thomas Porter was a bricklayer's labourer living in Water Street near the Strand. Richard Condon, a stonemason, domiciled in St Marylebone, and the other four, also stonemasons, all inhabited Ponsonby Place. This is a terrace of houses near Tate Britain, which are today a highly desirable address. Tom Porter, who was clearly the ringleader, also wrote his name in very large letters on the plaster right at the top of the adjoining wall. So after all this uh, walling up, while the existence of the passageway remained known, 
it could no longer be accessed until its surprising rediscovery by Giles Gilbert Scott in 1949. But now we come to the crux of the matter. How on earth did the legend that this was a Tudor doorway, which had us all fooled, arise? Well, by investigating press reports of the unveiling of the plaque in, in 1895, I discovered that its mastermind was this gentleman, Sir Reginald Deuce Palgrave, Clerk of the House of Commons from 1886 to 1900. He was the fourth son of Sir Francis Palgrave, the first deputy keeper of public records. Mm -hmm. He was evidently a well-regarded proceduralist who built on the work of his predecessor, Sir Thomas Erskine May, a name to conjure with. But his real passion was, perhaps unfortunately, history, and especially the life and times of Oliver Cromwell on which topic his enthusiasm considerably outstripped his adherence to any evidence. <laughs> For example, his attempts to redate the signing of the death warrant of Charles I were scornfully dismissed by the magisterial Samuel R. Gardiner as a very improbable explanation without a scrap of evidence in its favour. I investigated some of his other published work and here, in his colourful lecture to the Rygate South Park Working Men's Club, he lived in Rygate, by the way, which appeared back in 1868, are the origins of the legend of the door. I won't read it all out, it just goes on and on. But as you can see, it is based on his self-confessed showman's suppositions. And a lot of these words reappear almost verbatim, minus any caveats, on the plaque in the hall. And so they've unsurprisingly been pretty much believed ever since. So, to sum up, um, the chronology. So, 1660 to 61, doorway and passageway cut through the wall, and the whole site was blocked by James Wyatt. The whole site was partly unblocked in 1846. 1851, the whole cloister sites were both blocked. Passageway is now fully enclosed by Charles Barry and his, face, uh, and his festive masons. And here we are, 1895, the plaque marked its location and wove the story about it, subsequently broadly accepted. Then in 1949, the passageway was rediscovered by Sir Giles Gilbert Scott's workmen. They were actually putting in a ventilation system when they found the passageway. Um, it was recorded and sealed up again, apart from the access panel. The existence of the access panel was subsequently, we think, forgotten, and the passageway was little known. But finally, in 2018, the passageway was rediscovered and accessed once more. Infinite is the variety of fame and name with which the doorway may be coupled. <laughs> declared Sir Reginald Deuce Palgrave to the working men of Rygate. <laughs> now, I have to admit, this does very considerably overstate the case, but I hope I've convinced you all that the Palace of Westminster still has some intriguing secrets to give up, and also that a light bulb moment can be literal as well as figurative. <laughs> Thank you.